Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for you. Yes, I and someone has suggested that I watch this series and it's about uh, Julius Caesar. So naturally I'm interested because we learn a lot about Julius Caesar uh, when I was growing up. You know what I mean? I've watched all kinds of movies about him, all kinds of other documentaries and stuff about him. You know, but that's been a while. So let's do refresh here. You understand what me I'm saying, Ting? You know, uh, thank you guys for watching this with me. And uh, drop some comments, man. Comment down below. Let's start chatting and thing like that. I try to answer every comment that I can on there. So, you know, yeah, working all the time and, you know, I do uh, I set aside some time to watch it. So I promise you, I do read your comments. I do. But uh, this one is called... Uh, his year, Julius Caesar, 59 BCE. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Let's get started on Julius Caesar, people. Let's get started on it. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. In the summer of the year 60, Julius Caesar, approaching the end of his term as governor of Hispania Ulterior, returned to Italy. He had spent his time campaigning against the hill people of northern Spain, and for his efforts had been awarded a triumph by the Senate. This was a great honor, but Caesar had even higher ambitions. It took some arm twisting, but he was able to secure a special dispensation from the Senate, allowing him to run for consul two years before he was technically old enough to run. This was, strictly speaking, against the rules, but more and more common in the late Republic. So here is Caesar, sitting outside the city of Rome, waiting for the Senate to decide on the day for his triumph. This is when the conservative bloc in the Senate threw a curveball. They lobbied successfully for Caesar's triumph to be pushed back until after the deadline to announce your candidacy for consul. Why does this matter? Because triumphs were for active generals, and active generals were forbidden from entering the city. And if you couldn't enter the city, you couldn't run for consul. Why did they do this? Basically because Caesar was a radical reformer and they didn't like his stupid face. Caesar sent a letter to the Senate being like, okay, it looks like you guys made a scheduling mistake. But here's the thing, everybody knew that he intended to run. Why do you think he got that special dispensation to run early? He had been openly preparing for this campaign. He had actually left Spain early just so he could be back before the deadline. If they had a problem with him running, they shouldn't have given him the dispensation to run early. But if this was simply a scheduling mistake, Caesar was open to working it out. He suggested, how about you just let me declare my candidacy in absentia? The Senate heard his request and harumphed many harumphs. Such a thing just wasn't done, and they had already gone out of their way to bend the rules for Caesar. The Conservatives, led by a senator named Cato, had a field day with this. Cato filibustered, meaning that he spoke and spoke until the Senate was forced to adjourn for the day. You know, I uh, I have to be careful because I know conservatism then is probably not the same as conservatism as we know it here where I am. I don't know if it's the same way you are, but you know, things change. Like for instance, uh, back in history here, uh, the Democrats were the ones that were sort of for the slave trade and stuff like that, according to history here. And uh, the, the conservatives weren't, but the parties have switched over the years. And now we have uh, uh, conservatives who are doing everything in their power to gerrymander and not let minorities uh, get to vote. You know what I mean? So it's switched. So conservatism might be conservative. Conservatism might be different then than it is now. Comment down below. Let me know. Let me know because I'm not real versed on. I don't. I guess I do pay attention to comment to, to politics a little bit, but I don't go in depth to it because back when we call it politrix, it's politrix. So I, I pay attention to it because it directly affect everything including me but not to the point where i know the different the nuances of the difference over the years of conservatism and, and democracy and all these systems that we create in a way to control each other let's go ahead and youtube and since that i'm talking what i'm talking about let's go ahead and keep watching this vibe here and take you know what i mean it's the weekend. I'm off on the weekend, you know. My mind is on relax and watch. <laughs> that he spoke and spoke until the Senate was forced to adjourn for the day. No decision was taken on Caesar's request. Okay, message received. Obviously, this wasn't a mistake. This was sabotage. 
Coincidentally, Cato's son-in-law, Bibulus, was running for consul as well, with the full support of the conservative bloc. Okay, they had their own people. Uh, in response to this, politics. Caesar did something insane. He renounced his command. By doing this, he also renounced his triumph, which I cannot stress enough was an unthinkable thing for a politician to do. But by doing this, he gained access to the city. People watched, astonished, as he marched right down to the forum and officially declared his candidacy for consul. Caesar already had a strategy in place. He had arranged to run on a joint ticket with a man called Lucius. Since there were two consuls, this was sometimes done, but it was the exception rather than the norm. Caesar was a young and popular politician running as a reformer. Lucius was a wealthy, more moderate senator with no name recognition or, let's be honest, charisma. Lucius financed the campaign and paid the bribes, while Caesar made the speeches and rallied the people. Unlike Caesar, Lucius was by no means a radical. He was a close friend to Cicero, an extremely influential, slightly conservative, but ultimately pragmatic senator. Caesar was desperately seeking Cicero's support, not only for this campaign, but for the year to come. In this respect, Lucius served not only as a piggy bank, but also as an olive branch to the more moderate senators. As the campaign was drawing to a close, it began to dawn on the conservatives that Caesar was the clear frontrunner. Before every consular election, the Senate decided where the next two consuls would serve as governors after their term was up. This was done before the election, so the winners weren't subjected to any political shenanigans. Since the conservatives couldn't do anything about the fact that Caesar looked like he was going to win this thing, they decided to hijack this process. They started to make a big stink in the Senate about the physical degradation of rural Italy. This was kinda true, so they got some support from their fellow senators. As a solution, they proposed that instead of assigning a province to the next consuls, they should instead spend their time restoring the woodland and country lanes of Italy. Incredibly, the Senate fell for this. The motion passed. To many outside observers, including Caesar, this was another act of sabotage. But Caesar was powerless to do anything about it. Yet. When election day rolled around, everyone kinda figured that Caesar was gonna win. The real question became who else would serve as consul. It was a race for second place between Bibulus, Cato's conservative son-in-law, and Lucius, Caesar's uncharismatic ally. In the end, Bibulus won. This must have come as a surprise to Caesar, since the plan was for poor old Lucius to ride in on his coattails. Meanwhile, it was a huge coup for the hardline conservatives. Bibulus had planned to put a halt on all new reforms during his term. It was going to be an interesting year. The election for consul took... The, you know, you have to ask, man, do these politicians really want to help people? Do you know what I mean? Because they, 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 they're doing uh, one person that wants to do something, and then they're doing another person to stop that person from doing anything. So if nothing is... And then nothing gets done, so then the people suffer for it while they're up there politricking. Ain't things ain't changed much, huh? place in July, and incoming consuls didn't actually take power until January 1st. So Caesar had a ton of time to prepare, and he did. Now this hasn't come up yet, but it's important to know. Caesar was in a secret alliance with two other senators, Pompey and Crassus. This is known by historians as the first triumvirate. As consuls, Pompey and Crassus had a terrible time getting any significant legislation past the conservative bloc in the Senate. They each came in making big promises to their supporters, but neither was able to deliver. Pompey had come back from the east, a conquering hero, and had promised to set up colonies for tens of thousands of veterans in the newly conquered territory. This was expensive, and he couldn't get a bill through the Senate. Crassus had promised to bail out the tax collectors, which, as you can imagine, was pretty unpopular. It didn't oh, help yeah. that on top of this, there was a personal animosity between That's like bailing out the banks now. These two men secretly backed this young populace named Julius Caesar. If Caesar could pass these bills for them, they promised to back the rest of his legislative agenda. The group also agreed to pull any bill if one of the three found it objectionable. January 1st of 59 BCE rolled around, and Caesar and Bibulus began their turn. It was customary for the consul who got the most votes in the election to take the lead during the first month, with the second place consul taking the lead during the second month, swapping back and forth for the entire year. This act of taking the lead was called holding fasces. Caesar held fasces first. He immediately ordered scribes to take down all Senate business and to post it outside in the forum for the public to read. Forever the populist, Caesar knew that he had the people on his side and wanted to increase public pressure on some of his more conservative colleagues. 
His next move, and we're still talking about the first day of his term, was to put forward an ambitious land reform bill. Let's go into detail on this. At this time, Let's. radical land redistribution had been a goal of reformers for over 70 years. Over the last century, Italy's agricultural sector had been hollowed out. The huge influx of slaves and wealth meant that small landowners were being bought up by huge mega plantations with hordes of slaves doing the actual work. This had pushed entire Sounds generations like what's happening of poor now. farmers into the cities. These urban poor were now eligible for heavily subsidized bread, so this was a huge drain on the public coffers. Over the decades, these mega plantations neglected their land, and much of it was just sitting there uncultivated. Domestic grain production dropped while its demand continued to rise. This was a recipe for economic disaster, and the reformers had taken up the cause for generations with some limited success. Caesar's first bill on his first day was meant to address this. He proposed that they set up a land commission responsible for buying up land from willing mega plantations and redistributing it to the urban poor through a lottery. The expectation was that this would allow for thousands of urban poor to leave the city and set up small profitable farms on previously unproductive land. In order to maximize the number of people affected, applicants were required to be married men with three or more kids. And as a friendly gesture to Pompey, veterans were also allowed to apply. These new farmers were forbidden from selling their land for 20 years in order to prevent the mega plantations from just going around and buying it all up again. It, yeah. Many senators were concerned with the cost of this plan. As a concession to them, Caesar allowed for a region in central Italy called Campania to be exempted from the bill, since much of the land here was actually owned by the government and provided a steady source of income. The land commission was to be made up of 20 prominent Romans, appointed by the consul, who would then be responsible for the land purchases. After some senators raised objections, Caesar added a line to the bill that barred himself from serving as a commissioner. The thing is, before the public assembly could approve any bill, it had to be posted publicly for 24 days. Normally this wouldn't really matter, but Caesar had to hold fasces when the law went into effect. He needed the 20 men on the commission to be answerable to him. If the law went into effect when Bibulus held fasces, he could just stack the commission with a bunch of guys that would just reject every land sale. Wow. Caesar only had a few days to get this bill through the Senate if he wanted to get it passed by the public assembly before February. After the initial compromises were made, Caesar painstakingly went line by line and read the entire bill in front of the Senate, stopping after every sentence and asking if there were objections. There were none. After he was done, debate opened up, and Cato rose to comment. He spoke about how it was a very fine bill, but this year was just a bad time to do any major land reform. And then he kept talking, and kept talking. The dude was filibustering the bill. Caesar was beside himself. He had held the Senate's hand through this entire process, made compromises left and right, and yet Cato was still trying to torpedo this bill for no specific reason. Caesar snapped. He ordered Cato arrested. He had the authority to do this as consul, but the Senate erupted into chaos. A bunch of senators stormed out, with one telling Caesar to his face they'd rather be in prison with Cato than in the Senate with Caesar. The whole thing was a major misstep. Not only did Caesar alienate the entire Senate by trampling on its prerogatives, but he gave ammunition to his enemies. This is when they started to call him a tyrant. Caesar backed down. He released Cato and adjourned the Senate for the day. It was obvious that Cato and his conservatives weren't going to play nice, so Caesar had to think creatively. He took to the streets. He posted the full text of the land bill in the forum for anybody to read. and said, Man, that's what's kind of going on here right now. They, they filibuster in and stuff, you know, so, so stuff don't get passed. The question is, again, who are they catering to? The people who's working out there and having these tax collectors come in and, and make sure they pay the taxes and stuff? Or the people? This is nuts, man. You know, it's just like, we ain't doing nothing original, you know, we just, you know, for the, no wonder why uh, people call this place Rome sometimes. <laughs> it's other reasons, I know, you know, but I'm saying that's just one uh, micro reason here, you know. Simply proclaimed that the public assembly would vote in 24 days. He then went around and started to make a series of speeches promoting the bill to the public. The Senate never passed the bill. Caesar just decided to skip a step. Due to a quirk in the Roman Constitution, this wasn't technically against the law, but it just wasn't done. 
Pompey and Crassus surprised everybody by vocally supporting what Caesar was doing, which added some legitimacy to the whole thing. Caesar even invited Biblis to come and debate the merits of the bill before the public. He came, but the crowd was so whipped up that he was booed off the stage before he even got a chance to speak. At the end of the 24-day grace period, it was time for the public assembly to vote on the bill. Before the vote, a large conservative delegation arrived, led by Biblis and Cato, and followed by all of the conservative tribunes of the plebs and a bunch of lesser senators. The inclusion of the tribunes was significant, because both they and the consuls had the power to veto the proceedings. They had come to do just that. Upon their arrival, the crowd flew into a frenzy. Bibulus was making his way towards the speaking platform when the crowd attacked him. His bodyguards were overpowered, and he was pulled into the crowd. Bibulus legitimately thought that he was about to be killed. Instead, the crowd dumped feces on his head. The conservatives were absolutely distraught over what they saw and fled for their own safety. Once they were gone, a vote was called, and the land reform bill passed with a huge majority. Now, Bibulus would later claim that during this incident, he was exercising his veto the entire time, making the entire vote illegal. Caesar would claim that the roar of the crowd was so loud that nobody could hear what anybody was saying. You can decide for yourself who you believe. At last, I believe Caesar Biblius finally got to one. appoint his commissioners, and oh, look at that, top of the list, Pompey and Crassus. On February 1st, Bibulus held Fasces. His first act was to call for a meeting of the Senate to officially condemn Caesar for his use of mob violence. At a minimum, he wanted the vote overturned, and there was even talk of stripping Sounds Caesar of his again. The speaking order in the Senate always went in order of prestige, and in this case the order turned out to be very significant. Bibulus held Fasci so he got to speak first. As the other sitting consul, Caesar spoke second, in his own defense. Then, consuls from the previous years got to speak, two of whom happened to be Pompey and Crassus. They both supported Caesar's actions and said that the vote was legal. This really got people's attention. Not only did Caesar have control over the mob, but he seemed to have the support of some of Rome's most powerful senators too. All of a sudden, no other senators felt comfortable criticizing Caesar. Bibulus's proposal died on the floor. After this incident, Bibulus retreated to his home and basically did not appear again publicly for the rest of his term. In the absence of his colleague, Caesar unexpectedly held Fasces again, and as a cherry on top, the Senate was now kind of terrified of him. He had his big signature piece of legislation in place, so he started paying back his allies. The first order of business was to ratify Pompey's conquests in the East. See, Pompey had conquered an incredible amount of territory in the East, adding four new provinces to Rome. He also set up new protectorates and negotiated new alliances. Upon his return, the Senate saw fit to award him with a triumph, but didn't bother ratifying his new conquests or treaties. Even when Pompey himself was consul, he couldn't get his own conquests recognized by the Senate, which only shows you how broken this system was during this period. Caesar was able to get this squared away broken. with minimal opposition. See, much to Pompey's system is life. broken. Caesar I think also we're seeing to that Crassus today. Back for his support. Where I am, at least. supported by the tax collectors, who had got themselves into a bit of a bind. Rome didn't administer its own tax collection, but contracted it out to private companies who bid on how much tax they would be able to collect. Well, in the East, some of the tax That's collectors found idea. themselves unable to meet their own bids, like, by a lot. This was partially due to the fact that Pompey had spent years destroying commerce by conquering everything in sight, and partially due to the fact that the tax collectors just screwed up and overbid. Caesar lowered the amount of tax due by one-third, and everybody walked away from the whole thing grumbling, but the problem was solved. Another weird piece of old business that Caesar wanted to clear up had to do with Egypt. The previous ruler, Ptolemy XI, having no legitimate heirs, left his kingdom to the Roman Republic in his will. After his death, Ptolemy XII, an illegitimate heir, assumed the throne, and Rome never bothered to press its claim. Finally, in Caesar's year, Ptolemy actually traveled to Rome to lobby for official recognition as the true ruler of Egypt. Apparently, Ptolemy paid Caesar and Pompey a king's ransom in bribes. Caesar asked that the Senate officially recognize him and threw an alliance with Egypt in there for good measure. The Senate agreed, and the whole thing was taken care of. During this flurry of legislative activity, Bibulus, still housebound, would not stay quiet. Consuls had the power to decide when certain festivals and religious holidays were going to happen, and Bibulus was being a nuisance by putting them all on days when Caesar had votes scheduled. Technically, this should have made all of these votes illegal, but Caesar also happened to be Rome's head priest, and he seemed to think it was all okay. The people were quite content to just go along with this because they saw Bibulus as a laughingstock. 
Meanwhile, in the Senate, Caesar was able to get the money to resettle Pompey's veterans in the East, fulfilling his final legislative obligation to his fellow triumvirs. During the debate for this bill, one ex-consul named Lucullus spoke in opposition. When Caesar pushed back and lightly hinted that maybe it was time to start looking into old corruption charges, Lucullus threw himself on the ground and growled at Caesar's feet like a slave, right there on the floor of the Senate in front of everybody. This was an ex-consul. It was shocking. You may, or may not, remember all the way back to before Caesar was consul, when the conservatives decided that he was needed to protect the woodland and country lanes of Italy after his term. Well, Caesar hadn't forgotten. Serving as governor after your term as consul was a huge perk, and Caesar wanted to make the most of it. One of Caesar's allies put forward a bill to give him the command of Illyricum, which was on the Adriatic Sea, and Cisalpine Gaul, which was in northern Italy, two provinces. This was for a five-year command, which was longer than normal. He was also given the privilege of picking his own legates, which was usually something the Senate did. Just as this bill was going through, word came in that the governor of Transalpine Gaul had unexpectedly died. This province was just added to the mix, and by the end, the Senate had awarded Caesar three provinces and a total of four legions. By any conventional standard, this was overkill. Nobody got three provinces. I'm sure the Senate's logic was that once Caesar left the capital, politics would slowly return to normal, and if they needed to give him three provinces to convince him to leave, that was fine. It was around this time that Caesar proposed his second land reform bill, only a few months after the first one had gone into effect. We simply do not have enough information on Caesar's motives for this. Either Caesar felt emboldened by his newfound monopoly on power, or he felt that his first land reform bill wasn't as effective as he had hoped. Honestly, I don't know, some meat but on it. with this second bill, he turned his sights towards Campania, the publicly owned land that was explicitly exempted from the first law. There was enough land in Campania for 20,000 small family farms, and since Rome already owned the land, the bill could be implemented immediately, but it faced some fierce opposition in the Senate. Cicero in particular was a vocal opponent, saying that the loss of Campania would be too much for the Roman treasury to take. Caesar tried to bribe Cicero by promising to name him as one of his legates next year, but Cicero refused. In the end, many lesser senators found themselves intimidated or bribed, and the bill was able to squeak through without the support of men like Cicero. For his next mammoth legislative undertaking, Caesar... You know what, though? Did they call it bribes back then? You know what I'm saying? Uh... Essentially, that's what it is, I guess. You're paying people to, 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 to get what you want. You know what I mean? And that's actually, he's, a, uh, he's in the Senate and he's doing that. I don't think they do that very much anymore. They don't, money don't get, the only money that comes is from the donors who's giving money to the politicians to do their bidding, right? Uh, what they do is, I think, a lot of, uh, and they probably have some money going on there too, you know what I mean? Come on now, we live in capitalism. But uh, it's more uh, give and take as far as policies are concerned, you know what I mean? And, 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 and what people uh, value as important and stuff. And usually, it's not what's really important, you know what I mean? Because it's always something about like abortion or, 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 you know, just stuff that rile people up, but doesn't do anything to uh, help the poor. You know, every election cycle is the same major uh, quarrels, I should say, the same major quarrels uh, that is at the forefront of debates and stuff like that. Abortion, debates, you know what I mean? Things like that. Uh, so, you know, of course now the, the election fraud is uh, bumped into it and then there's the, the gerrymandering with the fixing districts up and stuff so that certain people can vote because if those people vote, certain people are going to lose and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So, hey, I know I'm equating again, but it's essentially the same type of thing, but they do it with a, with a twist, or we do it with a twist in modern times. Let's keep watching this bad boy. This is quite interesting. You know what I mean? I'll I, I, I look at history and I try to draw parallels. And the reason why is because we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Why don't we make the same good decisions over and over again, you know, from generation to generation, as far as helping the masses and the people, because the people are the, the backbone 
of any society. But, you know, if you could, like, brainwash the people, they don't do what you want, you know what I mean? If you make certain uh, issues uh, more relevant than others or more important than others, people will just follow. Oh, that baffles me, you know what I mean? That people fall for that stuff. But let's get, let's keep going. The support of men like Cicero. For his next mammoth legislative undertaking, Caesar tackled one of his pet projects, and again, it didn't make him any friends in the Senate. For the majority of Caesar's adult life, he had been fascinated with how Roman provinces were governed, and he had some serious proposals for reform. A lot of proposals, actually. He dropped on the Senate doorstep a bill with over a hundred separate chapters, covering everything from administration to tax collection to restrictions on bribery to rules on balancing provincial budgets. It sounds like something they're trying to do now. The conservative bloc in the Senate had devoted their careers to cruise. The progressives are trying to get the way out, get away from uh, uh, these large donors and do like the people are the ones that's donating. You know, that way they could do the bidding of the people and not the bidding of the the big corporations that are uh, donating money. You know what I mean? Because that affects climate change, that, that, that affects uh, uh, giving the poor stuff to live under better conditions and stuff like, you uh, know, more uh, higher wages and stuff like that. So it's kind of, wow. Like I said, no wonder why people call this the modern Rome saving against corruption. So they had a really hard time criticizing this bill. And by the way, everybody agreed that these reforms were badly needed. The conservatives hated Caesar's guts, but they couldn't find any way to block this bill without looking like complete hypocrites. It passed easily, and these reforms remained in place relatively unchanged for centuries. We are approaching the end of Caesar's term as consul, but at some point in the autumn, something weird happened. We can't say with certainty what happened, but we have rumors. Listen to some of these stories and let's see if a pattern emerges. The first version we hear is this. A man named Vettius came before the Senate and claimed that a senator named Curio, one of Caesar's chief opponents, planned to murder Pompey. Another version. Vettius said that Curio planned to murder Pompey and Caesar. Another version. Vettius said that Curio and a man named Brutus, maybe you've heard of him, planned to murder Pompey and Caesar. Another version. Vettius said that Curio and Brutus and Bibulus planned to murder Pompey and Caesar. Another version. Vettius said that Curio and Brutus and Bibulus and Cicero's son-in-law planned to murder Pompey and Caesar. Another version. Vettius wow. said that Curio and Brutus and Bibulus and Cicero's son-in-law and Lucullus, that guy who had fallen before Caesar and begged like a slave, planned to murder Pompey and Caesar. You get the idea. It looks like this started off as one rumor that may or may not have been true and conveniently ballooned until it touched almost every one of Caesar's political enemies. Get out your tinfoil hats because there's one more detail we know. The next day, Vettius was found dead. October rolled around and Caesar oversaw the selection of his successors. Bibulus inexplicably kept on pushing back the election date. The reformers ran their candidates, the conservatives ran their candidates, and in the end, the winners were Caesar's father-in-law and one of Pompey's old legates. Two reformers and two allies of Caesar. His legacy was now secure. Consuls officially handed over power on January 1st, and it was customary for them to give a farewell speech at the end of the year. Caesar gave his speech, it was normal, whatever, history doesn't remember it. Then, to everybody's surprise, there was Bibulus. The man hadn't been seen in public all year, and suddenly he wanted to deliver a speech. As he approached the speaking platform, a tribune of the plebs stepped forward. This tribune basically owed his entire career to Caesar. He invoked his veto, stopping Bibulus from giving his farewell speech, and stripping the poor man of his last shred of dignity. Caesar couldn't have asked for a better gift on his last day as consul. Man, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. You see, because like I said, I've, I've, I've seen stories, I've read books, and uh, on all on Caesar, but the, the, the nitty gritty details I didn't know about. But this is interesting. Now I'm seeing all the backroom vibes going on, the bribes, you know what I mean? The politricking and all of that that's going on there, man. That's interesting. And of course, to me, I'm always drawing parallels. Some people won't, but you know, humans would be humans, right? 
comment down below tell me some stuff man comment down below and let me know what the vibe is you know what i mean and uh i'll read all the comments man because some of you guys put some good information in there now you know what i mean and i'm enjoying reading it up and learning more i'm packing my brain y'all uh and that's a good thing the more you know that's a phrase where did that come from it's from a tv show and it ended saying the more you know <laughs> anyway man thank you all for watching this with me go ahead and subscribe if you had the you watch this that's part that means you like watching my ugly face on here <laughs> Y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.